by verse, usually. And the things we preach on here are not all that deep. Sometimes people say we preach on deep subjects. A lot of times they're just obvious things that nobody wants to endure today. They're pretty plain things. Pretty plain things. The title of the message today is going to be found in verse 28. I title it, Women Need Male Coverings. Let's look at verse 26 again, something we dealt with a few weeks ago. And I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands. Who pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account, which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I found not. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. And we'll go ahead to chapter 8, verse 1, which is still in this context. Who is as the wise man, and who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? Holy Father, we do pray for blessing and interpretation and guidance today. I'm certainly unworthy, Lord to understand these great things but you've revealed them to us and we pray for thy Holy Spirit and pray for good ground attention and obedience to thy word today in Jesus name amen one thing we can do today I need a pocket knife to do it but we need to dissect the brain any of you kids want to help? Nathan, maybe? Think you can? He's excited about that. Listen, um, we know there's a God. How? By the effects. We know from creation there's a God. You know there are radio waves when you turn on a radio. We know what's in the brain. We know there's a spirit. We know that there's a spiritual mind. But there's a physical brain. The Bible says, out of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So you know what's in a heart by what's on the outside, to a large degree. We know from the Bible, absolutely, how God made man and female. And he gives us some guidance along this line. And even modern science, many times when people are willing to admit it, is lining up with our holy scriptures. Now by male coverings, when I say women need male coverings, I do not mean male clothes. I mean male coverture. Male pastors, fathers giving away their daughters, protecting them on this road to marriage, husbands guiding the wives, being a faithful godly husband, uh, sons of the elderly as the Lord on the cross taking care of his mother, and in general in society. So proper female dress is a picture of that covering that God has given mankind. Now the glory of young men is their strength. And you know the devil comes to rob you of your glory because in some ways, your glory is not only that which causes you to shine, but it is that which gives you protection in many ways. The glory of women is their long hair. Not in some superstitious way, as some people say, uh, but their feminine beauty, their softness, their outward and inward biblical, godly, feminine beauty. It's a biblical principle that the outward should not be exalted at the expense of the inward. But neither should you throw away the outward as if the symbol is of no importance. Now, as we said, Satan comes to steal your glory, cause you to pervert it or abuse it. 
The woman becomes strong and powerful when she walks in her glory in obedience to God. Remember that. The Bible speaks of weak women. Remember who the Bible calls the strong woman. Not what the world calls the strong woman. And she becomes a symbol of all of mankind. As the Bible tells us, we are weak. I mean, we are strong when we are weak. In other words, when we are weak in ourselves, we are strong in the Lord. When we're covered by the Lord. When we rely upon the Lord. The long hair of the woman is a picture of the Lord and His covering. The woman is a picture of all mankind. So let us notice this order, and we'll get to the point here. Look at chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now we know that Christ... Our Lord is equal with God. So we're not talking about inferiority here in an ultimate sense. We're talking about a subordinate order that God has given. There is protection in the positions that God has ordained. And if you will be attentive today, we can get through that. I need three hours to get through it, but it wouldn't matter anyway because you couldn't pay attention for three hours. But if I do a little bit this week and a little bit next week, you're not going to remember what I preached last week. So I'm in a mess. So I need your attention for one hour, and I'm going to do my best to try to get this truth uh, summarized the best I can. And I believe it will bless you. I really do. And really understand the power of reviewing things. Uh, you can watch the Beyond Off-Grid documentary. You're going to get something new every time you watch that. There's things that the, the speakers say in that, that that just go right over your head, but the next time you listen, you'll get something more out of it. And uh, I hope my sermons will be the same way. I, I don't expect you to understand every little part, but I want to introduce it. I want to put it on tape, put it on record, that you could go back and listen if you ever need that subject. Uh, as Beyond Off Grid showed so well, there is protection in the family. There is a protection in the church. If the state ever gets empowered beyond its place, as we see, it will begin to hinder the order and power of the family. Why? Because it knows that that is where the influence lies and that is in competition to the state. So what does the state do? It exalts the individual. Why? Because there's no power in the individual. See, and don't let this gathering together in social media make you think that you're connected. You're not connected to these people. And they hinder what you're able to say on social media. So there is power in the family Power in the church, power of influence that competes with the state many times and those who want to control the state. And the state has its place. So if you can get people to be individuals, then they can basically believe that they are worshiping this individuality when really they're just following what they want them to follow. They got you alienated away where now you can be controlled by the propaganda and make you think you're walking in liberty. Then we know deceivers creep in the house, lead astray silly women, not all women. But there's a danger that if you get away from your place of safety like Dinah, went away from her father's house, got outside the protective hedge that Song of Solomon talks about with the wife, the family, a hedge, a uh, she got outside of that, and you saw what happened with Dinah. Like the woman in Proverbs who feet, whose feet abide not in her house. We see pictures in the Bible of women leaving the place of protection out from under God's will. Eve, independent from Adam. You can watch predators. You can watch lions and zebras and that type of thing. And you can see among the animal kingdom, they wait and they lurk. And they watch for the weak, but what are they watching for? Somebody that strays too far from what? The herd, the pack, where you can get picked off. 
This is what began everything, folks. With Adam and Eve. In the last days, as the book of Jude tells us, the individual will be empowered, guided, to throw off all constraints and guidance of parents. It says 2 Timothy 3, disobedient to parents. They will despise government. They will speak evil of authorities, dignities, fathers, husbands, the local church, pastors. And all of these can be abused, rendered useless, or harmful even. But the Bible predicts a dangerous time upon the world when children will disobey Many parents will be, uh, many women will be led astray from their houses, and in general, there will be a despising of all authority in the home and in the church, especially. And we know Elijah comes to repair the breach, that is, the alienation that is between children and fathers that's fostered by the world. But my main point to you today is that Eve should not have acted alone, independently of Adam. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. That's in the local church, not outside the church. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved. That speaks of the judgment seat of Christ, the millennial kingdom. But in general, it speaks of her protection. Her protection. It's not an absolute protection. But there is some protection in a woman walking in that family unit that God has called her to. That domestic place. She shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. It doesn't mean you have to have children or you even have to be married necessarily. But there is a protection with the father, with the husband, in the family unit, doing what God has called you to do as you are able. It means there's a protection under the covering of Adam. If Adam walks in the uprightness and place God has for him, there's a protection in the family sphere. Paul had made this point earlier. He says, I want you women to adorn yourselves, not like the harlots, not immodest, but in modest apparel, not meretricious, but like the marrying kind of woman, not like the Greek harlots, the courtesans that the Greeks would intermingle with, not like that class of women, but let everybody know that you are the marrying kind, the kind a wise man would want to marry and have children with. There is a safety and blessing in not leaving your place as the angels that left their first estate did. The covering is your glory. But glory is also a protection when ordained by God. A woman is protected by her head. Man. But also her long hair, which speaks of her natural beauty. You are protected when you walk in this natural domestic femininity that God has given you. When Peter says the inward is the most important of all, that inward feminine submission, those daughters of Sarah, which is why Paul says you'll be saved in childbearing. He means in being the godly woman that God has called you to be, not a rebel. What will you be saved from? You'll be saved from deception if your heart is right and your heart is into it and you want to be obedient to God. How can true femininity be protection? Because it keeps the woman under the coverings that God... It is, femininity itself is a covering. And it keeps you under the place of refuge and protection that you might be saved from the creeps that are lurking. Second Timothy says in the last days, they're going to wax worse and worse. These deceivers, these creeps, they're out there like lions, like Satan. They're lurking and waiting for you to just have a bitter heart or, 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 or just get outside that place of protection, wander outside of it like Dinah. They're waiting for you. So when we say a man, man himself is a protection to the woman, that man is a covering, it is also true that a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. So we must also say 
if a glory is also a protection, that a virtuous woman also protects her husband. Not necessarily in the same way that the man protects the wife, but she is a protection to her husband. It says in Proverbs 31, the virtuous woman, her husband shall have no need of spoil. That is of being tempted. Tempted financially, tempted in lust or any other thing. There is a godly protection that a virtuous woman brings to mankind. Mothers, sisters, daughters, wives, in the church. Men need women and women need men. What we're giving you today is the doctrine of what they call complementary as opposed to the feminist, egalitarian view of things. See, the egalitarian view says, no, they are equal in every way, and, and I'm going to show you an exception. If you ever show me how in general women and men are not equal, I'll show you somebody in Germany or somebody somewhere and show you. See, we saw a girl that can arm wrestle. Uh, in other words, there's always the exception they point to. Exceptions do not matter, my friend. We're talking about how does God see, how did he create the majority of women and the majority of men? Men need women and women need men. In nature, we call it a symbiotic relationship. There's a shark. The shark needs to be cleansed. It eats little fish. But every now and then it realizes it needs to go to the health club. It needs a cleansing. It needs, a, it needs to go and, and it will lie in a certain position to show the other fish, hey, I won't eat you at least for 30 minutes. So the other fish know, the cleanser fish. They come and they cleanse the shark. They get to have a fine meal, the shark gets a bath, and then they say, time's up, I'm gonna go back to eating you. So this is a symbiotic relationship. Uh, study these things, they're really fascinating to see. You right now, you are walking around with a symbiotic relationship. You have belly bugs, creatures inside your belly, and you would be shocked to know what degree your happiness, your energy, your health depends. Solomon understood it. They're just now understanding it today. Solomon says you need to, to eat things of the lily family. You need to eat prebiotics and feed your bugs. People aren't feeding their bugs today. Oh, every now and then they go out and eat some yogurt and get some probiotics, but you're not feeding your bugs with prebiotics. And a lot of people, the, their problem is just simply because of depression, a lack of energy, and a lot of other things, your bugs are in a mess. You walk around with an animal kingdom in your belly, and you need to take care of it. And they'll take care of you. This is nature. This is creation. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. As man honors woman and cherishes and takes care as the husband of his garden, women take care of you. And as you take care of your man, he takes care of you. Uh, this is how God intended things to be. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, The eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Now listen to this. Nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. The man needs the woman. The woman needs the man. The head of the woman is the man, says the Bible. But the man cannot say, I have no need of the woman. It says in 1 Corinthians 11, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. In fact, the Bible says God made all things good. That's what Solomon says in the last verse of Ecclesiastes 7. God made man upright. He made all things good. But one thing he said was not good. He said it's not good that man be alone. That's not good. It's not good. So God made woman. 
to help man because he needed that help. He needs that help. Now, we know Adam sinned greatly. I'm not going to repeat. I got too much to do. I'm not going to repeat the sermon I did a few weeks ago on the deceived woman. But the question is, why wasn't Adam deceived? Why was not Adam deceived? There is something about Adam and the way he was made that he was not deceived. Can he be deceived? Of course he can be deceived. In one way, he was deceived. But the point here is this. Adam knew that he was not going to be a god. Adam knew that he was going to die. Eve, on the other hand, was deceived. You need to ask yourself, why? What is it about the way a woman was created and the way a man was created that the man was not deceived? Why does God put the man at the head of the church, the head of the family? Why does God put a stallion at the head of the herd? What is it? Is it just physical strength? Or is there something that a man can see and should see and is more capable of seeing? And it's not that the woman is inferior it's that she's created for another purpose. And because she has a nurturing role to play in the family, because she is there to nurture the children and do so many other things in society and the church and, and the family, God created her a certain way and created man a certain way. And they have a symbiotic, complementary relationship. And when they work together, all is well. Why is the man called the husband in the marriage? Why is he the farmer, the vine dresser? If the wife is the vine, why is he the husband? Why is that not reversed? She's the fruit bearer. Why does Paul tell wives to ask their husbands at home what is taught in the church? Does he mean to say women can't understand the Bible the way man can? Why does he say, go ask your husband at home? What does it mean when Solomon says, which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not? One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. Now you could follow the atheist and the liberals, and you could say that Solomon is saying that men are slightly more godly than women. Do you believe that? I don't believe that. His father David once complained. Psalms 12, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. For the faithful fell from among the children of men. If David was concerned in his day that the faithful man has ceased, what about our day? When perilous times shall come, can you find a faithful man you can trust? You better wake up. Solomon agreed in Proverbs 20, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man, who can find? If you put a thousand people, will there be a faithful man that you could trust among them? However, it's not just faithful men that are hard to find. Solomon says in Proverbs 31, who, the Bible, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? In that day and age, Solomon says, go try to find one. Go try to find one. So in all ages, virtuous people and faithful people are hard to find. In the last days, they are especially hard to find. But they're there. They're there. Don't say in your haste they don't exist. Godly women exist. I know many. Godly faithful men exist. I do not believe that he's saying that one in 1,000 men are godly, but he cannot find a godly woman. I don't think that's what he's saying. One answer that many commentators give is they say, well, Solomon had 1,000 heathen concubines, and he couldn't find one among them that were godly. Whoever the woman in Song of Solomon happened to be was godly. 
the one he should have been with, the only one. However, I believe Solomon is far wiser than that. And in looking back, I think Solomon would have had enough wisdom to look outside the one class of outlandish women. Men and women are both bad and growing worse today. It's not wise, listen to me as I say this, it is not wise to overlook the evil and deception that either sex is capable of in this dark hour. That and that only is what this church is about as far as this subject. If you're going to go out here and deny the capacity for evil and the reality of evil, whether it's in men or in women, then you better believe we're going to kick against it. You better believe we're going to sound an alarm against it. But this is the case today when women often get a free pass in Christian sermons, books, and films. We know because they are the financial market and also because, for darker reasons, the agenda to destroy the family and create a one-world government. So there's some way that you can fix it by going MGTOW. MGTOW means uh, basically men saying women are bad. I'm done with marriage. I'm done with women. It's not safe. It's not wise to marry in this day and age when the state is so wicked and there's a conspiracy against men. I will not marry. I will not end up in a court uh, fighting for my children. I, I will not go down this road. And a lot of them are saying I'm done with women, period. No, that is not the proper response because there are strengths and weaknesses in both men and women. And God doesn't care about political correctness today. He doesn't care how you feel about these subjects. He doesn't care how Oprah Winfrey or anybody else feels about these subjects. God loves everybody, but He's going to say what needs to be said and give you what you need to hear. The Bible speaks plainly. Because God knows you need the plain truth so you can be protected. I won't get into it a lot today, but God says what he wants to say and what he needs to say about every race, about every people, regardless of whether or not it's politically correct today. Regardless of whether you'll get fired off FM radio because you happen to say it. No, God says the Cretans are liars and slow bellies. He says that's what their own prophets say and that's what they are. And you're going to be pastoring a bunch of Cretans. You, Timothy, or Titus, are the pastor of a bunch of Cretans. They tend to lie, they're lazy, and you've got to know that. Rebuke them sharply. It's not going to help Timothy at all, or Titus. It's not going to help the young man at all to lie. God tells you what is good and what is bad in all families, all nations, all races, and whether you like it or not. Men and women. He tells you what your weaknesses are, what you're prone to, what your differences are. And you can get yourself all upset. You can follow the feminist revolution and pretend there are no differences. But you're a fool if you do so. You can find exceptions to try to overthrow. Well, I found a Christian one time that wasn't a liar. What does that matter? These are generalities, divine statistics. Divine stereotypes. And if you don't stereotype, you're an idiot. If you don't discriminate in a godly way, if you don't stereotype in a godly way, now, to make too much of a stereotype is wrong. They believe the Samaritans were generally carnal, rebellious. So the Lord would oftentimes use parables about the good Samaritan. You don't want to go too far with things. But God has something to tell you. God has something to tell you. Look at Romans 1. Is Solomon saying that men are slightly better than women? Or slightly more godly, at least? I don't think so. Romans 1, he says, For this cause God gave them up into vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. He's saying that when a society begins to fall, when a nation begins to fall, 
The last thing you will see fall is the woman. If she's the last thing that falls into lesbianism, if she's the last thing that falls into this type of immorality, then she must have had some innate goodness, not enough to save her in eternity without the blood of the Lord Jesus. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But at least some natural tendency to resist such abominations. We could actually say when women finally become prone to these types of vices that men easily fall prey to, we're done for as a nation. We're done for. It's over. But you don't want to throw men under the bus either today. In juvenile delinquency centers, women are more abusive to the teen boys than men are to the teen girls. Those are statistical facts. Among teen dating, girls are more prone to physically assault a boy today than the other way around. That made headlines around the world. It's teen girls assaulting boys, not teen boys assaulting girls. Women way outnumber men in initiating divorce because she doesn't feel loved anymore. So let's quit all the propaganda. Let's quit all the lies and nonsense. Let's show where women are bad and weak and where men are bad and weak. Let's show their strengths and weaknesses that have remained constant throughout the centuries. And today there are some strange things going on with hormones and drugs and increased powers of propaganda. Now, if the Bible in Romans doesn't teach that women are less godly in general than men, then Solomon must mean something else in Ecclesiastes 7. Could he mean then, in general, religious perception, men are smarter than women? So Solomon would be saying, in general understanding of the things of God, general faith, men and women are both bad, both ignorant, but men are slightly more open to the things of God than a woman. Listen to me now. Otherwise you'll get upset later and you're not going to listen to what I'm saying. I have not personally seen that to be the case. And I don't apologize for sermons. I don't get up here and give disclaimers and apologize and try to make you feel warm and fuzzy. If I tell you something, I'm honest. I have not found it to be the case that men are slightly more open to understanding the things of God. Not by years of my emails. Not by years of talking to men and women. I find women, many of them, to be very open to the scriptures, to be deep thinkers. And I don't think those are the exceptions. Though anybody today that's wise, male or female, you are an exception. Let me give you something beyond my experience. The Bible teaches that a woman came to anoint Jesus for his burial. None of the disciples who walked with him daily would hear what the Lord was plainly saying. He says, I'm going to be crucified. Then I'm going to resurrect. I've got to die. The disciples would not hear. But this woman heard and believed, and the Lord said, wherever my gospel is preached, this woman and what she did, her understanding, her discernment will be preached. So we could say woman gets one point for believing the message on the cross. You say G uh, John the Baptist preached the Lamb of God must die, but even he as a prophet was preaching, but when he was in prison, he had a moment of weakness where he did not understand why Jesus was not taken over the Roman government. So for believing the message of the cross, a woman believed it. Who was the last at the cross? Women were. Who was the first to believe the truth of the resurrection? Women were. It is not the doctrine of the Bible, nor any doctrine or sermon anybody has ever heard preached from this pulpit by me that men are more open to the general truths of God in the Bible than women. Because I don't water down parts of the Bible, I don't play the Christian feminist game, I'm naturally accused of all kinds of injustice. It comes with my calling. I believe that boys should be raised in the home to honor sisters. I intend to do more on that regard. 
to serve them in a way that a boy should, to help them, to use their strength, their ruggedness to serve their sisters. But I also believe that sisters should use their strengths, their gifts, their natural creation to bless their brothers. Again, symbiotic relationship. Boys should be taught they have a place. They have a responsibility in this regard. Since women should ask their husbands at home about the church service, does that mean that women are incapable of giving sound counsel to their husbands or men in general? Wisdom herself is personified as a virtuous woman. Abigail, Abigail gave David sound advice, saved him from many lifelong regrets. And she believed in his anointing as king, by the way. And what's so wonderful, she did it all in a feminine manner, not a haughty manner. But she came because she had something to teach David, to help David. And what a blessing. Let me give you another example. Judges 13, Manoah said unto his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. Now who's getting hysterical? He is. But his wife said unto him, If the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would not have received a burnt offering and a meat offering at our hands. Neither would he have showed us all these things, nor would us at this time have told us such things, nor would at this time have told us such things as these. So he was the one being fearful full of amazement, and she was the one being reasonable to him. So plainly, women can bring much reason to the marriage, to the family, and they should. Eve was given as a help, meat for Adam, to neglect all that she has to offer is foolishness. Read Romans 16. No woman was a pastor, no woman was a deacon, no woman was an apostle. But you would be a fool not to realize the degree that Paul, the great apostle, depended upon women in the early church. Read Romans 16 and see. So what does Solomon mean by his words? Specifically, it appears to be this. One man among a group of 1,000 men and women has he been able to find. So that would be 500 men and 500 women. He's saying in whatever specific situation he's talking about, men fare slightly better. But we don't know how much better. He doesn't mean that a woman cannot be found at all. Notice he says, One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. Many people mock the Bible and say, Well, that's absurd. If it's a thousand men, then you wouldn't find one woman. Well, you don't need to be an idiot with the Bible. He could easily be saying, take a group of a thousand people, 500 men, 500 women, you're not going to find one, you're only going to find one man among those thousand. But a woman, you're not going to find, at least not in a thousand of them. He goes on to verse 1, chapter 8, and says, Who is as the wise man, and who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? I believe what he's saying is somebody that can understand this particular thing that he is discussing throughout the book of Ecclesiastes we've seen before that we can go back to the book of Job where he says behold chapter 33 I am according to thy wish in God's stead this is Elihu talking I am also formed out of the clay I'm a man like you behold my terror shall not make thee afraid neither shall my hand be heavy upon thee for God speaketh once yea twice yet man perceiveth it not he is chastened also with pain upon his bed that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. God puts you through chastisements. There are things that don't seem right that happen unto you sometime. He keepeth back his soul from the pit. If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand to show unto man his uprightness. That is the path that he should walk in. So Job is saying, Elihu is saying this, I am come from God to be the interpreter for you. I am going to help you through this, Job. Nobody else has been able to help you. They've just accused you falsely. I'm going to really help you, and I'm going to defend God. I'm going to speak for God and show you how to be upright and not as an animal, how to think through this thing and trust God. It took not only knowledge, it took great courage and boldness to go to Job in front of those men 
and say the things that he said, being the youngest of all. Chapter 33, verse 27, He looketh upon man, and if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which was right, and it profiteth me not, he will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. Hearken unto me, hold thy peace, and I shall teach thee wisdom. So Elihu becomes the one man among a thousand who has this interpretive ability, this light. What does he show? He, he interprets Job's afflictions and shows that no, Job doesn't have these secret sins, but yet he's not totally perfect. He's perfect in a relative sense, but he has some things he needs to learn about God. He's spoken unwisely with his mouth, uh, uh, at least to his friends. And this interpreter, Elihu, is going to come. He's a very rare person. You're not going to find him one in a thousand men who will be able to say and be willing to say the things that he says without evil surmising. It's not only the eagle eye understanding of things in the long run that somebody like this needs. They have to have a willingness and an ability to confront and reprove like Abigail did in such a feminine way. We've seen Psalm 73. There are people that are atheists right now because they say it's not fair. I don't understand why there's wickedness in the world. I don't understand why wicked people prosper. I don't understand by wicked, why wicked believers are blessed. But I'm suffering. This injustice, this apparent injustice is one reason we see through a glass darkly. It's one reason that we say, Lord, thy kingdom come as on earth. Thy will be done as in heaven on earth. The point is, God, when are you going to come and this mystery of iniquity is going to cease when you're no longer using evil for your purposes? When are you going to fix all of this, God? It's hard for believers. It's hard for every man to be confronted with apparent injustice of providence. You have to look at the long run, not the immediate. That's a hard thing to do. The psalmist in Psalm 73, when he went into the sanctuary of God, he heard the word of God read. He heard the teaching. He then was able to understand, see the long run, to see what's going to happen to these wicked people in the end. Certainly not many women will understand and even less, if they do understand, will be willing to reprove. A woman is not naturally as confrontational as a man. A woman does not naturally tend toward accountability as a man. Again, exceptions mean nothing to Solomon's statistics. Solomon says, I counted this thing out. I have observed it in life. You're not going to find anybody smarter, no greater researcher than Solomon. His stereotyping is inspired. So what do we need? What interpreter do we need? What is he supposed to interpret? The only link between Ecclesiastes and Job is the apparent injustice of providence. Notice, he's already said this. In Ecclesiastes 7, all things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness. And there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. Solomon's saying, how do you explain this? How do you explain the fact that godly righteous men are suffering, but wicked people are prospering? Chapter 7, right here in our chapter, Solomon's saying, this is a vexing problem, very vexing. He says, where is the interpreter that can explain these things? Ecclesiastes 8, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked. There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, even though these things be true. There be just men unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said, this is vanity. So both Solomon and Job have been vexed with this apparent injustice of God's providence. Job needed somebody to come interpret this for him. Solomon searched for somebody to give the answer. And he says in the end, I'm going to tell you this. 
those able and willing to come give this answer. In my life, he says, my personal experience, I've only found one man in a thousand. And I haven't found any woman in a thousand that could come give me this answer. Does he mean women are worse than men? No. I believe it goes back to creation and the purpose of creation. What did Eve become deceived in? Was it not that the devil not say, you are suffering in this garden because you have this command? You have a very bossy father. She says, I only have one rule. He goes, oh, but, but look at this fruit. Look how good it is. He's trying to keep you from it. He's trying to hold back your potential. There's something about a woman that you just start whispering that type of thing to them. It's very easy for them to fall for it. Solomon does not say that all women are hysterical, full of amazement in the face of rules or authority. There are daughters of Sarah. There are the virtuous women, the excellent, excelling women. But who can find her? How quick are many women to say to a man, you're being taken advantage of here. You shouldn't let them take advantage of you like this. If a woman ever loses sight of the big picture, the devil is able to grab a hold of her and use her as a net. Job's wife, in her weakness, became a dangerous snare. Because of a woman's beauty, because of the love that men often have for them, men can lose their own heads. She can become an adulteress like Potiphar's wife, or in the form of an Eve, or a Zipporah. One man among a thousand could Solomon find that could and would give proper counsel to somebody that's bitter, to who is tempted to have a bitter heart, tempted to faint, accuse God unjustly, to think God's ways and His commandments are too severe, His commandments unloving, His providence unjust. But one woman among a thousand He has not found. He does not say she does not exist, nor that you cannot find her. 1 Kings 11, when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. In Jeremiah 44, the women said, Since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings, we've wanted all things. We've been going through a hard time, they said. We've been consumed by the sword and by the famine. But when we burn incense to the queen of heaven, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings without our men? The women were inclined to look at the present experience. We might ask a question. Who is more inclined to sympathize with a complaining person wanting to leave their spouse? Who is more apt to give empathy and sympathy? Is it not a common experience? Certainly exceptions to the case and certainly times when a woman's mercy can become very, very sinister and cruel. But in general, women are the embodiment of mercy and men tend more toward justice. And it's important when somebody's saying, I'm about to leave my spouse, I'm going through a hard time, it's important to hear a word that says, you know what? What does God want you to do right now? Let's give due process in this situation. Whatever the suffering is, Whatever the complaint is, there's a time when the sinner does not need to hear coddling, empathy, and sympathy. He needs to know you love him or her, but they need to be told, this is what you need to do. Speak the truth in love, in gentleness, in humility, in meekness, but the truth needs to be told to people. You need to be faithful. You need to do what's right. Believe me, I've been pastoring for many, many years. I know a long series of buts, 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 buts. All of the exceptions, 
all of the whining, all of, I understand it all. But there's a time when a pastor has to say, in spite of all of that, this is what you need to do. And they'll look at you shocked. Are you not hearing everything that I'm telling you? Yes, I am hearing you. And there are many that will give you empathy and sympathy and all the things that you need, but somebody needs to tell you what to do, son. And unfortunately, there's not going to be many people that are going to tell you what you need to do. God forbid. A woman's going to go do the wrong thing and she can find 3,000 women that will empathize and sympathize with her and help her jump off a cliff. But what people need at times such as that Our truth, responsibility, accountability. Not just mere, this is, praise God, there are women. And I understand that women can hold people accountable and men can be merciful. I understand this. I'm giving you generalities that God has given us, I believe, in the Bible. That a woman is more prone to sympathize and empathize and a man is more prone to see what needs to be seen and hold somebody accountable. I wish everybody was perfect in regard to these things, but we're not. The fairer sex is made for bearing children and mothering children. That's not the only thing. Uh, they're made for beautifying the home, beautifying society, giving that balance to men that men need. They nurture, they console, they are apt to give sympathy. But if they're not careful, they will give sympathy to the devil himself. Or at least be used by him. The serpent was saying, have mercy on yourself and your poor husband. This father of yours is cruel. He has this rule, this command, and is holding you back from perfectly good food. From a wonderful experience. From your full potential. From godhood even. Who had pity? She did. She had pity upon her husband, pity upon her own plight. If you want to see this thing in operation, let me show you 1 Kings 2. Adonijah, the son of Haggith, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. Why didn't he go to Solomon? Why? And she said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. He said, Moreover, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And she said, Say on. And he said, Thou knowest the kingdom was mine, and that all Israel set their faces on me, that I should reign. Howbeit the kingdom is turned about, and has become my brother's, for it was his from the Lord. And now I ask one petition of thee, deny me not. And she said unto him, Say on. And he said, Speak, I pray thee, unto Solomon the king, for he will not say thee nay, that he give me Abishag the Shunammite to wife. And Bathsheba said, Well, I will speak for thee unto the king. This wicked man knew women. Bathsheba is not evil here. Bathsheba has been deceived by this wicked creep who came and preyed upon her pity, preyed upon her feminine mercies. He said all the right words. It was his from the Lord. And this woman who had repented and had become a good woman, who had been instrumental in getting David to confirm Solomon into his kingdom, the wicked preyed upon her naivety. And Solomon rose up after promising to give her anything she wanted and says, why don't you just ask the kingdom? Know ye not that he's going to execute you and me and everybody? And Solomon put him to death for his wicked manipulation of his own mother. Bathsheba was no doubt thinking that everybody had been rather harsh to this poor fellow since he was repentant. This is the danger of all, male and female, to be too quick to trust the repentance of wicked people and act upon it. You don't want to go to the other extreme like they did in 2 Corinthians, but you don't want to be in 1 Corinthians either. Women especially are sympathetic creatures. They can be cruel when following authority blindly or when deceived. And we live in an age of sympathy for the mother who kills her unborn. 
but no sympathy for the baby. We live in an age of sympathy for the adulterous and covenant breaker, but not sympathy for the children of the family that must suffer. We live in an age of sympathy for the sodomite, but not sympathy for the children who end up victims in the culture. Let me show you this contrast between male and female in 1 Thessalonians 2. We were gentle among you even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Okay, what do you see in the female? Gentleness, cherishing, consoling. And you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children, that you would want worthy of God who hath called you into his kingdom and glory. So what you see in a man is charging, commanding, strengthening, but also long-term vision. Long-term, we need to do what's good for the kid in the long run. Get up, boy. Get up. There is often a conflict between male and female when they're walking in their natural roles. You must have the long-term vision. Sure, by all means, moderate it to whatever degree God wants it moderated by the present experience. But you must have that masculine long-term vision and Paul says, I came to you with both. I came to you with nurturing. I came to you with gentleness. I came to you with these feminine things. But I also came to you with masculine love, tough love. That which charges you and commands you and strengthens you and makes you bold and, and gives you the long-term vision of the kingdom that's coming. In the 19th century, The Royal Path of Life was a very, very popular book. It said, Man is bold, 1881. Woman is beautiful. Man labors in the field, woman at home. Man has a daring heart, woman a tender loving one. Man has justice, but woman mercy. While man combats with the enemy, woman is waiting to sweeten his existence. Without woman, man would be rude, gross, solitary. Woman spreads around him the flowers of existence. She's superior and inferior to man. They have stronger affections. No trait of character is more valuable in a female than the possession of a sweet temper. Home can never be made happy without it. She stood by the expiring Jesus. She was the last at his tomb and the first to discover that he had burst the bars of death. She is seldom a leader in any project but finds her peculiar and best attitude as a helper. Let's look at the researchers, the academic researchers at the time. Here's Popular Science Monthly of 1895. They said, in perception, woman is in general decidedly quicker than man. The subjective factor is larger in women, and she sees things from more of the standpoint of her own experience, her wishes and prejudices. She thinks more in terms of the concrete and the individual. Men try to bring things under a general rule without so much regard to the fitness or symmetry of the result. Women care less for general rules and are inclined to look only to the immediate end. Women are less disturbed by inconsistency. Analysis is relatively distasteful to them, and they less readily comprehend the relation of the part to the whole. In language, she is more apt than the man is. Girls learn to speak earlier than boys. In many kinds of routine work, especially that requiring patience, women are superior. Laughing, crying, blushing, quickening of the heartbeat are more common in women. And in general, her face is more mobile and witnesses more to her mental states. Women are more easily influenced by suggestion than men, and a large percentage of them may be hypnotized. Sympathy, pity, and charity are stronger in women, and she is more prominent in works that spring from these sentiments. Woman is more generous than man. Her maternal instincts lead her to lend her sympathy to the weak and the helpless. Seeing present rather than remote consequences, she feeds the pauper and pardons the criminal. Male criminals outnumber female criminals about six to one. Woman's sympathy and love, her physical weakness and timid nature, her domestic and quiet habits ill adapt her to the criminal life. Morally bad women, too, usually find other more attractive fields open to them. Some forms of crime, indeed, such as murder by poisoning, domestic theft, infanticide, are much more common among women. When women do become criminals, their crimes are often marked by greater heinousness, cruelty, and depravity. The most marked moral superiority of woman appears in her altruism. Her greatest moral defect in her untruthfulness. Woman's religious nature is stronger than man's. You had uh, Ron Paul running for president. And he said, now listen, I'm not going to take away your welfare, but for the long term of the country, we need to tighten up 
and we're going to do this thing gradually, but I'm going to fix the debt. We're going to fix the immigration problem. We're just going to fix this welfare. We need to quit thinking of this thing just about your present experience. We need to look at the long run here. They kicked him right off the stage. America said, no way. We want nothing to do with any type of long-term goals and any type of sacrifice at the moment for the future. What is the whole idea of sparing for the crying? You're saying, you know what, I'm going to save this boy from hell. I'm going to save her from hell. That's what we're going to do. I'm not interested in his present feelings. I'm interested whether he grows up to be a good boy or not. See, that's what men do. Sure, they need to be balanced. Praise God for women. There's a place. But you don't want to force a man to think like a woman in this regard. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 4, Refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Why didn't he say old husband's fables? Are men capable of believing fables? Yes. But there's something here that they can fall prey to that we need to understand. Maybe it goes back to why Adam was not deceived. I'm going to just take a few moments here. I won't read it all, but I'm going to give you how some modern neuroscience is starting to believe exactly what the Bible teaches along this regard. We don't believe everything, or nor can everything be proven here, but Larry Cahill just recently, March 29th, says denying the neuroscience of sex differences. It's now abundantly clear to anyone honestly looking that the variable of biological sex influences all levels of mammalian brain function. Gloria Steinem, the feminist, once called sex differences research anti-American crazy thinking. A senior colleagues warned me as an untenured professor around the year 2000 that studying brain differences would be career suicide between the sexes. Tactics include magnifying or inventing problems with disfavored studies, ignoring even fatal problems with favored studies, dismissing what powerful animal research reveals about mammalian brains, hiding uncomfortable facts and footnotes, pretending not to be denying, uh, pretending not to be denying biologically based sex influences on the brain while doing everything possible to deny them. So are female and brains the same or different? We know that the correct answer is yes. The neuroscience behind this conclusion is now remarkably robust. No one seems to have a problem accepting that on average male and female bodies differ in many, many ways. Why is it surprising or unacceptable that this is true for the part of our body that we call the brain? Senior colleagues warn me as an untenured professor, et cetera, et cetera, that it would be career suicide. Although some believe that sex differences in the brain are small, the average effect size is no different from the average effect size found in any other large domain of neuroscience. So they're going to say, well, look, it's just a little difference between male and female in this one certain area. He says, but those little differences make big consequences, big results. And it's the same with all study of the brain. It's now abundantly clear that the variable of biological sex influences all levels of mammalian brain function. Most neuroscientists assume that brain differences between male and females, if they existed at all, are not fundamental. Gradually, however, we neuroscientists are seeing just how profoundly wrong and, in fact, disproportionately harmful to women that assumption was. So all the scientists are looking and they're saying, let's study this thing. And they're like, uh-oh, there are big differences between the male and female brain, but we're not allowed to say it. You're not allowed to say it. You're not allowed to publish the research. You're going to get in trouble. You'll be fired. People, professors are being kicked out of colleges. P people are losing their grants. You're, you're just not allowed to say it. You have to say everybody's the same. Male and female are the same. But that hurts men and women. It hurts men and women to not understand our differences. Here's another study at PNAS.org. We confirm that typical females on average are more empathetic. Typical males on average are more systems oriented. A, recent, a recently released study from the University of Cambridge claims to show that male and female brains are clearly very different. In a huge study of over 600,000 people, the data obtained showed that men tend to be more analytical and systemic while women tend to be more emotional and empathetic. Praise God for that. You need that emotion. You need that empathy. But we also need 
the stallion, the rooster. We need the male, the husband in the home to watch. We need the pastor. We need the male pastor. There's a reason God made him a male. There's a reason God put the husband at the head of the house. And there's a reason he said you're not to be alone. You need a woman. Really bad. Here's Medical Daily. Study. Women's brains are more sensitive to negative emotions. They react differently than men's. Stereotypes of men always set them as the rational, cool-headed thinkers, while women are more sympathetic to the emotional plight of others. But are these categories unfounded? Maybe not entirely. According to a new study, the researchers reported greater emotional reactivity in women may explain many things, such as they're being twice as likely to suffer from depression and anxiety disorders as men. Previous research, in other words, they're saying if you deny these brain differences, then you are not helping the fact that women are going to tend to be more depressed in certain situations. You're hurting women by ignoring all of this neuroscience. Previous research has also given credence to the theory that men and women respond to emotional stimuli differently. Overall, women reported being more reactive to emotional images. Meanwhile, and, and people know that. Oh, believe me, they know it. Meanwhile, higher levels of testosterone were most frequently associated with lower sensitivity to the images, while higher estrogen levels, regardless of the person's sex, almost always meant increased sensitivity. That's why when you fix hormones of a woman, many times she comes and hugs you and gets sweet. It's an amazing thing to see. It's an amazing thing. A stronger connection between these brain areas in men suggests that they have a more analytical than emotional approach when dealing with negative emotions. As Stephanie Potvin, associate professor, it is possible that women tend to focus more on the feelings generated by these stimuli when men remain somewhat passive toward negative emotions, trying to analyze the stimuli and their impact. I believe that we do see at least some of these things in the Bible, this contrast. And it shows us why God has given women a covering and how women can be a blessing to men. If you know your tendencies, your weaknesses in general, then you could utilize your coverings. Listen to what God said to Abraham, Genesis 20. Unto Sarah, I, 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 to what the Bible said through this king. Unto Sarah, he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other. Thus she was reproved. Maybe Sarah was doubting the leadership of her husband. Maybe she was doubting how everything was going to turn out in the end. But by God's providence, by God's mercy, Abraham came out rich. And the king said, he is a covering to your eyes, Sarah. And Sarah was reproved. The Bible is not shy about telling us differences between male and female. In Isaiah 19, in that day shall Egypt be like unto women. It shall be afraid and fear because of the shaking of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he shaketh over it. There's nothing wrong with being a woman in that regard. But a mighty man is not to be afraid in the same way a woman naturally would be, by her very nature, by her very creation. When you teach that all men and all women are the same, and their brains are the same, and their personalities are the same, then there's going to be a desire to make men into women and vice versa. Uh, vice versa. So in marriage and in, count, in courting, in dating, the new ideal is a bisexual, metrosexual vampire. And I've read where many women are saying that this sounds nice, this nice feminine creature, but anybody married or, or around him for two weeks would vomit. That's what women are saying. Men are going to be men, and you cannot make them into women. Well, they're trying to. It's not wise to do so. And when you don't understand that a man thinks differently than you, it's going to hurt you. And same with men. If we don't understand that women think differently um, about some things, not inferior, just different. They're put here for a different reason. You've got your place, she's got her place. So the masculine brain can lean more toward tough love, the culture of capital punishment, retribution, injustice, not just reform. 
responsibility and welfare? Where is our masculine ideals? Where are they gone today? They're gone. If girls are weaker in body, then there will be chivalry and protection. A recent news article said that after the Bahamas hurricane, they were evacuating women and children first. Just a few weeks ago. Why is that? What do you mean women and children first? What do you mean you are evacuating women and children first? What kind of nonsense is that? No, but when you understand there's differences between male and female, then you understand the women should be evacuated first. What about if the men just stood up and said, I identify as a woman? How could you deny them the lifeboat? When Laban exercised authority as the oldest son after his father died, why was that? What written law? Was there something from creation that said we need to allow the masculine insight in regard to these things? Is there something needful about the, the natural masculine mind and how much more when it's rooted in the spirit of God? Where is the brain today, the male brain? Does it even exist anymore? That's a question you need to ask yourself. Here's another neuroscience biobehavior review. Evidence suggests that there are differences in the capacity for empathy between male and female. Females are more pro-social, sympathetic, empathetic than males from childhood through adolescence. Here's another neuroscience magazine from 2019 journal. Recent studies indicate that gender may have a substantial influence on cognitive functions. Men and women appear to have different ways to encode memories, sense emotions, recognize faces, solve certain problems, make decisions. By using this special algorithm, we confirm that the gender-related differences exist in the whole brain, as well as in each specific brain region. These gender-related brain structural differences might be related to general gender differences in cognition, emotional control, as well as neurological disorders. Simon Baron Cohen wrote a book called The Essential Difference, Male and Female Brains and the Truth About Autism. In 2003, The Guardian said, why do so many women love talking about their feelings and relationships? Simon Baron Cohen argues that men's and women's brains are made differently. The female brain is hardwired for empathy and the male to understand and build systems. In 2006, a female neuroscientist, Luann Brizendine, wrote her book, The Female Brain. The main thesis of the book is that women's behavior is different from that of men, due in large measure to hormonal differences. Many neuroscientists would say it goes beyond hormones. St. Petersburg Times says, Brizendine brazenly promotes pol politically incorrect concepts. You're just not supposed to say that. Men are more overtly physical and aggressive, where women are less confrontational. Many women will admit to playing games. Women are less willing to bury the hatchet quickly. Men are more likely than women to make peace with their competitors after competition ends. Women typically are more comfortable dealing with issues under the table instead of being direct, working their issues covertly or through other people, which can be good if it's done in a holy way, can be evil if it's done like Herodias in her plotting way. My point in all this, Church of God, is we don't do anybody a favor. You don't help anybody. You don't help your marriage. You don't help your children. We don't help society when we don't understand. There's differences between male and female. I'm not an expert on all the differences, but I believe as we search the scriptures and try to learn and try to understand, it helps us have patience with one another. It helps you understand that your husband is not a woman. You're not married to a woman. And it helps the husband understand he is not married to a man, praise God. It helps us understand we need both. God has made male and female. And we need both. We need both. And both have their place. Man has been put for a reason in the leadership position and a woman is safer when she acknowledges that.
when she is a Deborah, inspires it. When Deborah comes to inspire the weak man, to put him in that place, to help him walk and grow, to help your sons grow into men. Holy Father, we do pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that you'll help us understand what we need to understand, that we might have the feminine virtues and graces that are so often reflected in women, that you will help us walk in the tough love and the masculine love and the justice and responsibility and accountability that is so missing in our culture at large today. Help us not be blinded by a rebellious heart to what's so important. And Father, I do thank you for godly interpreters that you send to bring wisdom, whether male or female, regardless of how hard they are to find. I thank you for the several that you've given me. So many godly women that have helped me through trials and helped me understand and be encouraged and trust you. We do pray that you'll help us grow as a church in our families, as singles, as children, May you be glorified. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen.